In today's show, we're going to interpret and review some key biomarkers that you should focus on and track, in my estimation, every single year. In the link in the description below, I will share with you the PDF that I recommend going to your doctor or ordering directly through LabCorp or Quest or Direct Labs and running these same tests. I run these tests on myself every single year. I've been doing that since 2006, so I have almost 20 years of data now. And let's dive into my own labs. And I'm, I'm not making this about me. I hope throughout this shortish video, you'll have a better understanding of which tests you should focus on and run and what those interpretations mean and how to make changes going forward. Okay, so the tests that I run, you can look at this, you can take a screenshot of this, or you can simply download the blood work cheat sheet in the description below. We order the comprehensive metabolic panel along with LP little a, we looked at TSH, uh, we also looked at ApoB to A1 ratio, we looked at alpha fetoprotein, which I'll talk about later at the end. I don't recommend looking at this if you don't have active cancer. I went down this rabbit hole and it's caused just a bunch of unnecessary stress, so I don't recommend looking at cancer biomarkers unless you have active cancer and you're tracking that. We also looked at fibrinogen, ferritin, we looked at hemoglobin A1C, fasted insulin, C-reactive protein, fructosamine, I think that's pretty much it. I didn't run hormones because subjectively I feel great. I'm 42, I'm not on HRT. I do take 40 milligrams of DHEA in the evening time. I feel that that's a great natural way to help to decrease cortisol levels as you age, uh, in the evening particularly, and also provide the necessary precursors to testosterone and other androgens. So I'm a huge fan of DHEA but you need to test your DHEA levels. Mine tend to run on the low side, that's why I supplement. So the first thing that I like to do when I'm working with clients is to look at their metabolic health parameters. As you know, between 92 and 94% of US adults have some degree of poor metabolic health. And the way that we can assess this is looking at glucose, insulin, hemoglobin A1C, triglycerides, and liver enzymes. So there's five ways to look at this. Again, we talk about this extensively in our blood work masterclass. If you wanna dive more into that, you can. I'll put that in the description below, but if you just rewatch this video, you'll have a good idea. So let's first look at glucose. Now, it's important to understand that I did this fasted. Okay, normally I actually recommend after we get a fasted panel to do non-fasted or post-meal labs. And how we do that is we eat a meal that we habitually eat for me, it might be a ribeye steak and half an avocado. And then about 90 minutes later, we're gonna to go to the lab and get our non-fasted labs drawn. We wanna look at insulin, glucose, triglycerides. We also wanna look at ApoB, how that shifts. It's important to, to know both, in my opinion, but because I've done so much non-fasted blood work in the last five years, I decided to do fasted blood work this time. Now, you might be saying, Mike, your glucose is 94 milligrams per deciliter. I'm not worried about that. I actually had to wait a really long time at the lab and I was kind of stressed. I don't like venipuncture. I don't like an 18 gauge needle going into my veins. I, I always request a butterfly, by the way. So my glucose is a little bit on the higher side, but I test my glucose all the time at home with a glucometer. It usually fasted, it's around 85, 86 in that ballpark. So it's a little bit higher, not t terribly concerned. My hemoglobin A1C is 5.5. That was a little surprising to me, but as you might know, over this past summer, I've gotten really into making my own bakery products at home, making sourdough bread, sourdough pizza, things like that. I've had more carbohydrates as of late. I think I need to cut back on that. And the reason, as you might have learned, I think there are health benefits to sourdough bread and sourdough baked goods, but I also uh, realized that perhaps I've been overdoing it. And the reason why I got into that was because my daughter's an all-American endurance athlete. She needs more carbs for her 10, 12 hours a week of training and, and events and races and things like that. And I was sick of buying all this gluten-free bread and gluten-free tortillas and things like that. I just wanted to make it myself for her. Now, she's doing really well competitively, so I'll keep at it with her, but I might back down a little bit. Ideally, your hemoglobin A1C would be under 5%. But that being said, it's not the best estimation of metabolic health because it really depends upon our breakdown, the rate of breakdown of our red blood cells. Everyone's a little bit different. Looking at the uric acid, you can tell a little bit from insulin resistance as well as gout if uric acid is high. Mine is obviously you know, right on the lower end of, of the mid, mid range of the lab, which is what we would expect to see. Interestingly, my serum creatinine is actually a little bit lower than I might expect. Last time I ran this, 
although it was non-fasted, it was 1.2. So creatinine can give you a good idea about your lean muscle mass and protein. If you're satisfying your um, macronutrients when it comes to protein, electrolytes, mine are always in these ranges, the sodium, potassium, chloride, CO2, and things like that. I'm not sure what to make of the low phosphorus. I'm not terribly worried about that. Um, we'll go back through these other uh, bilirubin and, and alkaline phosphatase and lactate dehydrogenase a little bit later. But as I mentioned, let's check off the first bucket, metabolic health, glucose, insulin, hemoglobin A1C, triglycerides, liver enzymes. Okay, that's the bucket that I like to look at first with clients. We have a moderately... I know it's you know, just at below the threshold uh, of prediabetes and so forth. My hemoglobin A1C, 5.5. But when we go on down to the triglycerides, I really like to look at triglycerides as a marker of poor metabolic health or optimal metabolic health, and they're 49 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, that's usually what you see in people who are metabolically flexible, who exercise, who are physically fit and so forth. Then you look at the HDL cholesterol at 81 milligrams per deciliter. But then I also like to look at the liver function tests. And so the AST, ALT, and GGT. Okay, so these are enzymes that your liver makes, and when they're becoming infiltrated with fat, they can increase, particularly the GGT and ALT. So my liver enzymes honestly tend to run around 25 to 27. As I mentioned, I've been, and this is international units per liter. I've been running my lab since 2006. These are the, these are the trends. Uh, I'm not worried about them. I like that my GGT is actually on the lower side it historically can run a little bit higher. So these are great ways to actually look at your metabolic health. You know, if your triglycerides are increasing, what often follows is the liver enzymes increase, even before insulin and glucose. With that said, let's look at my insulin. Mind you, this is fasted insulin. Also, we have fructosamine. So I was looking, I haven't really explored a lot with fructosamine. I would love to be able to look at glycated albumin but we'll look at that a little bit later. My insulin fasted was four, which is really on the low side. So as I mentioned, I've been having a lot more carbs lately. We've been having sourdough pancakes, you know, not a ton of sugar in there. We had a little maple syrup, but at least three days a week. And sometimes we make a sourdough pizza at night and I make bread once a week. And my fasted insulin and triglycerides are quite low. But that being said, as we get into the winter, I'm probably not gonna consume that as much during the summer. We do a lot of hiking, biking, running. CrossFit, things like that. So we have more carbs, not worried about it. But because my A1C is a little bit on the higher side, I might tailor that down a little bit. The next thing I like to look at is markers of chronic inflammation. And then we're also going to look at the lipids a little bit further. But first, I just want to say thank you for being here, friends. If you're enjoying the content, hit that like button and be sure to subscribe to the channel so you get pinged when we launch videos like this in the future. Since we're talking about metabolic health, I just want to remind you, berberine is a natural tool that has been used for 3,000 years to help support metabolic health. New research finds berberine hydrochloride also helps curb food cravings. So if you want to support your metabolic health and also if you're prone to evening food cravings, you may want to consider taking the Berberine Fasting Accelerator by Myoscience. There's well over 300 reviews from people just like you who are finding this is a great tool to help support their metabolic health. You can go to myoscience.com, which is M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com and use the code podcast at checkout to save. So going back, we want to look at my inflammatory biomarkers, but I think it's important that we also first check off the cholesterol box because I know this is so controversial. You know, people say, well, LDL cholesterol, it really depends upon the continuous lifetime exposure. The higher your, your VLDL and LDL cholesterol over time, that means that it's going to increase the probability that those LDL particles will cause atherosclerotic plaque. I tend to think it's a little bit more of a nuanced conversation and the metabolic environment can initiate or exacerbate the possibility that LDL will become modified or oxidized and therefore cause plaque. So what we want to look at first is VLDL, especially in a fasted state. I love to see this under 10. And so I'm not just saying that because mine is eight, but I'm saying that because this is what I look at with clients. VLDL and triglycerides really tell the story when it comes to trends in metabolic health. As you get more insulin resistant, more overweight, you start to have more sugar, you don't exercise, triglycerides, VLDL go up long before insulin and glucose. So that's really important. What I also like to look at is ApoB to A1 ratio. Now, my ApoB is high, but the ratio is quite good. The ratio is 0.5. 
So this is really important because we want to look at, again, not just LDL, but LDL in the context of HDL. Now, this is really curious because I've been having a lot more carbs lately. I know that when I go keto or carnivore, I'm a lean mass hyper responder, but even having more carbs, you can see my APOA1 is quite high, and that is a reflection of my commitment to staying physically fit. The easiest way to increase HDL cholesterol, in my opinion, could, you know, some people, this is debatable, is through exercise. Some people will say, well, if you go on a low carb, high fat style diet, your HDL will, will increase. Yes, it will. If you're lean and if you also exercise. So you can see here, my APOA1 is quite high. Now, it's important to acknowledge that an unearned high HDL cholesterol is not always a good thing. My HDL cholesterol is earned because I train a lot. I walk a lot. I run a lot. I hike a lot. I exercise. So that's earned. My HDL is high because I embark on healthy lifestyle change. And what we care about is the ratio, not just the absolute number of APOA1. We want to look at APOB in the context of APOA1 because it turns out that APOA1 and HDL cholesterol particles or, or moieties have anti-atherogenic effects as well as anti-inflammatory effects, which is what we're seeing here. Okay, since I mentioned inflammation, let's dive into that. First, looking at my white blood cell count, okay? Right, you know, midline of the lab, 5.9 units per liter here. Uh, and so this is what we see when people are trending towards chronic inflammatory states because they have prediabetes, they have obesity, they have arthritic pain, things like that. We tend to see the white blood cells increase along with changes in the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio and an increase in C-reactive protein. So let's look at my C-reactive protein. Okay, so here's my C-reactive protein. It's 0.2 milligrams per liter. This is what we love to see. We love to see this under one, ideally under 0.5, but this is 0.2. And so although c protein is not necessarily specific, it's a general marker of chronic inflammation, we do wanna see this on the lower end. So I love to see in my clients a low or, or you know, uh, white blood cell count in the mid, lane, mid range of the lab along with a low c protein. Then we also, since we're talking about chronic inflammation, we wanna look at ferritin. Because this tells the story too, when, as well as uh, fibrinogen. So ferritin is an acute phase reactant. I know it's a long-term store of iron, but it also acutely increases, for example, if you have a common cold. I'll share this quick story. Back in 2007, I started getting into these labs. I was only doing this about a year. And at the time of my draw, I just had a little cold. I didn't think much of it. My ferritin was over 400. So I thought I had hemochromatosis and I went and measured the gene and it turned out I didn't have hemochromatosis per the gene and my ferritin had dropped down. My mentor warned me of this. He said, anytime you see a lab range out of whack, simply redo the test. So I think that's important to understand that we should just redo that test. So my ferritin, iron, TIBC, iron binding capacity are all well within you know, the, the moderate uh, midline of the lab range, which is what you would like. Now, most men, I will say, tend to, as we transition now, we talked about chronic inflammation, we covered metabolic health, we covered lipids. Let's talk about blood viscosity. So this is common in postmenopausal women, as well as men of all ages. Remember, men, we don't menstruate. I know this is like a politically charged thing to say, but men do not menstruate. Okay, so therefore we tend to accumulate iron and that can lead to problems, including increasing our blood viscosity as we age. So we wanna look at iron as well as ferritin and we're gonna go on down the list here to also look at our hemoglobin, hematocrit and RDW. Okay, so what do you notice here? My hematocrit is quite high, 49%. Uh, percent. And so, I don't know. I might consider donating blood again recently. Uh, you know, last time I donated blood was in February. Um, but also my hematocrit is earned. That's the important thing here because I train a lot. I exercise a lot. I think exercise is one of the most important things you can do for your health, second to sleep and whole food nutrition. My hemoglobin is also on the higher side at 16.8 grams per deciliter. Uh, and my RDW and RBC is kind of in the midline of the lab. So that's important to acknowledge. So we want to look at our hemoglobin, hematocrit, ferritin, along with RBC and RDW to assess our blood viscosity. And people who are athletic will naturally have higher levels of hemoglobin and hematocrit. So I'm not terribly worried about that. But if I had, for example, prediabetes or high blood pressure, 
I might consider donating blood because blood viscosity increases the shear stress in your arterial system and in your um, cardiovascular system, and that can contribute to or, or exacerbate atherosclerosis. So I think that's important to acknowledge and recognize. We also, I mentioned uh, fibrinogen. So we're going to look at that. This is on the lower side. Fibrinogen, fibrinogen activity at 234 milligrams per DL. I see this in clients who have had a first degree relative that had a heart attack at a young age. Oftentimes their fibrinogen is in, on, in the 400s or 350, uh, can be quite high. So that's something to consider. I always recommend running fibrinogen. Uh, this will increase, for example, after getting a COVID-19 thingy or also getting the actual infection itself. This is uh, not a, a biomarker that you wanna have elevated. I don't know all the tools to reduce it other than exercise eating healthy, whole, real foods, uh, moderating your stress, getting good sleep, and working on sleep disorder breathing, I will mention that sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing will worsen all of the biomarkers that we talked about, from chronic inflammatory biomarkers to the metabolic health biomarkers and beyond. Now, you might be saying, well, Mike, why are you measuring your alpha feeder protein? This is a, a lesson I learned back in 2016 was when I did this. Um, alpha feeder protein is a biomarker that's used to track testicular cancer once it's diagnosed. And I made the mistake of ordering all these tumor biomarkers. You know, I looked at CA125, CA10, uh, a lot of different biomarkers just for fun in 2016. And AFP came back high. And you might notice that the lab range is zero to 6.9 nanograms per ml. So I was worried about that. I retested it. It's been 59 or 60 for the past eight years. So I don't worry about that, but I also tend, because the uh, alpha feta protein is high, I do run my beta HCG. So in men who have testicular cancer or other issues going on with the testicles, HCG will increase. Normally you would see that increase in pregnant women. I don't suspect that I'm pregnant, right? That's not why I'm running it. I'm running it to rule out possible testicular cancer because my alpha feta protein is on the higher side, which leads us with our final lesson here. Some people just have biomarkers that are slightly out of whack. I have one client who has really low white blood cell counts. I'm not really worried about that. I have another client who has a GGT that is always 59. It's like always, no matter what. This person has tried N-acetylcysteine, glutathione, all these things. It doesn't change. That can happen. So that's important to recognize. I also, since I mentioned uh, N-acetylcysteine and detox, I want to focus on, on one biomarker, and this is bilirubin. And we talk about this a lot in more detail in the, in the blood work masterclass. If your bilirubin is over two, and the units here are milligrams per deciliter, that might be indicative of Gilbert syndrome. This is relatively benign, but it does indicate a genetic polymorphism in a really key detoxification enzyme known as UGT glucuronosyl transferase. Uh, and this enzyme is not only responsible for metabolizing bilirubin, it's also involved in detoxification. So this is an important biomarker that you should consider looking at. And this is part of the comprehensive metabolic panel, which is on our blood work cheat sheet. So everything we recommend is right on page one, opt into our email newsletter list. You will get access to that PDF and other related videos. So in conclusion, we wanna look at metabolic health. We also wanna look at insulin, VLDL, the ApoA1 to ApoB ratio. We want to look at our blood viscosity biomarkers, chronic inflammatory biomarkers, and including fibrinogen and blood viscosity related biomarkers. This is it's really not that hard, my friends. Uh, I work with a lot of people who you know, do coaching calls with me. If you're interested, we can review your labs. Um, but this is a great way just to assess your overall metabolic health as well as chronic inflammatory health uh, and make associated lifestyle changes. So what do you think? Let me know in the comment section below. I'm grateful that you tuned all the way in. We'll catch you on a future video down the road.